when I was going around the world, when I trained on those first two sailboats, I went looking for gales and storms. And so I'd know what I was doing in the ocean. The places I went in that sailboat, I mean, it's just, you know, in the Bering Sea and, 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 and the Aleutian Islands and Kerguelen in the, in the southern Indian Ocean. But it's down at 40 to 50 south, right? Down by Heard Island. <laughs> no, there's nothing, there's nothing like that. If I hadn't have done that, you know, those three voyages, I wouldn't be content. And so since I've done them, to answer your question, I am content. If you don't push boundaries, you have no idea where they are. And then when you get over to over 65, you can't push boundaries anymore. I mean, because you have physical issues, so. No, I think it's great. I'm glad you came up and marched up the hill. Never dressed up, but that's probably all right, isn't it? No, couldn't be better. <laughs> <laughs> I met Greg Soroka on the 8th of June, 2019. Making my way up Mount Baldy on foot, I passed by what the next day I came to learn was Greg's camper. The cut block below Alpine in which he was anchored was alive with spring wildflowers and insects and birds and other animals that had woken up from a long winter. And in a way, so had Greg. From inside his home, music could be heard. A cassette player played classical music, and along with the sound of the birds and the wind, it filled the air on the mountainside. I hung flagging tape to guide my landing for later that day and made my way up the mountain, wondering for a while who it was who had made the mountain their home. Similar to Greg in his days of youth, I was there that day to learn my craft, to throw myself into the sky. Those were days of great adventure that went on to pave the way for even greater ones. Any extreme sport, you'll have this phase where you don't know what you don't know. But at the same time, if you're a free spirit and adventurous, you're going to discover the folly of not knowing what lies ahead and trying it anyway, because that's where the fun is. In 2018, before I had the knowledge and experience to put myself above the remote landscape of Mount Baldy and Mount Dunn, I set about building a foundation of the skills needed to achieve that goal. And like any paraglider can attest to, those are wild days. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good. Can't complain about this. What are you? Early on in my first year, I knew the one thing most likely to keep me alive was not necessarily my skills in the sky, but on the ground. Leaving the earth and returning to it in a controlled manner is essential. And so I trained myself to know the lines of my wing like a guitar player knows his strings. One time for the folks that been down since day one. Thanks to those that's down, I left with this. 
Restless Lake Scene. We're here for good, so don't mistake the name. Cutting, scratching, blending. It's about to begin. It's true that no cool kick off this year. But if it wasn't for the DJs, you wouldn't even hear us. Do time for the folks that been down since day one. Open your eyes, cause we're the same old guys. We be the elevators of minds, the regulators of change. Restless Lake Scene. Don't mistake the name. In 2018, near the end of my first summer flying, I knew I was prepared for what I considered my next challenge. So I set off to Mount Baldy, north of Kamloops. What do you think of my mission today, jumping off a mountain? I'm going to dig your, uh, your grave at the bottom. <laughs> okay, no, I, no charge. Six feet deep. Six feet deep. I'm 6'1", so make it long enough. Yeah, that's why we make it eight feet long. <laughs> eight feet deep, and that should hold you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh. right ah, yes, the Dunn Range. Don't dig a grave for me yet. I've traversed this landscape by foot in summers, along its pathways made by diligent trail builders, along its ridges, wind scoured and barren. I've climbed Dunn Valley's rock, its solid, solid rock. I've traversed this range by skis, cold November days determined to find snowpack, late spring journeys among the lingering alpine winterscape, and in summers, <laughs> for the novelty of saying I skied in August. And finally, I'm sitting here with a magic tarp, learning how to traverse this landscape in a very new and different way. Little did I know, the following year I would meet a man named Greg Soroka on the side of this mountain, and he would change the way I look at this landscape forever. You can see the, um, you came by on a Saturday, so this is, you know, some people might know what those are, but the, um, I've got about, I went away on my, on my sailboat. And I had it in the order of um, 80 to 120 operas. And so they were all on cassettes. So on Saturday afternoons, like in my generation, we used to listen to Howard Dick on the CBC radio and Saturday afternoon at the opera. And so for some reason, my mind still works that way. So, so you came here on a Saturday and I was listening to the Flying Dutchman, the Fliegen de Hollander by v Wagner, his first opera, first out of his 10. And, um, and you walked by and um, I didn't didn't see you walking by. I just saw up the hill somebody striding away, and then I saw the um, the two poles with the ribbons on them, and I couldn't figure that out. But you know, some people they they think weird things, and they they put out ribbons so they won't get lost or something. So I I didn't know what they were, but I didn't want to touch them either. So um, I didn't see you again until uh, until the next day. But um, I, was, I started talking to you then, and then. You had actually walked up there and you flew down and you walked back up again. And um, so we're at 1,250 meters here. No, we're at 1,650 meters here. And that's about almost 23. It's, it's over 2,200 meters. And um, so you can walk up. I, I thought that was pretty good. Most of the people come here, like people come here on dirt bikes. They really know what they're doing. They're not like I do. But they go racing up there and 15 minutes later they come racing back. And people come here by here on four by fours. Like there's about every second day or every third day, there's maybe a vehicle, either a motorbike or a four by four. And there's not very many, so it's pretty good. The um, but you do you weren't like that, so so I thought you were quite novel, and I still think you are. <laughs>
I've always had a cat on board, like I call myself a single-handed sailor, and I really am a single-handed sailor, but um, I've never done it without a cat. So um, cats don't follow instructions that well. Um, they're kind of with you because they want to be with you, but you know, she didn't really have much choice. I just shanghaied her from a tiny little village without a road in, in Chile and Patagonia. And I shanghaied one f before that from the Galapagos. The Galapagos, what a jewel of a place that is. There's so many magnificent places in the world. <laughs> but no, I, so I still have a cat. I don't know. So, so I've had four of them now in my adult life. And I don't know, you don't like to part with them. So I'm not sure I'll get another one. But. Hey, did you want to go in? Huh? Did you want to go in? Huh? Go on then. Go on then. Psst. Psst. No. When I was going around the world, when I trained on those first two sailboats, I went looking for gales and storms. And so I'd know what I was doing in the ocean. And when I finally got into the ocean, you know, into the deep sea, all I had to, you know, I had, I had a real good idea of, um, of um, strong winds and sail handling and all that. I just had to learn about the motion and the big seas. But the places I went in that sailboat, I mean, it's just, you know, in the Bering Sea and, 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 and the Aleutian Islands, and Kerguelen in the, in the southern Indian Ocean. Look at Google Kerguelen sometime and see where it is, right? Like it's halfway between Africa and um, Australia, but it's down at 40 to 50 south, right? Down by Heard Island. <laughs> and um, I stayed there for three months. And so, no, there's nothing There's nothing like that. And I mean, and, and then, you know, the botany that I saw on, on tropical islands and, and, and what's called the... Um, Vosque um, Atlantico and the Brazilian rainforest and the and the Chilean rainforest. It's just fantastic. I mean, the botany in the world, Southern Hemisphere botany and Southern Hemisphere birds, they're just, they're awesome. And um, so, no, I mean, it, the, the, the life that I had on that sailboat, which was the life I planned for and the life I trained myself for and the life I dreamed of, but I've realized it and physically I can't do it anymore. So I don't, I don't really, I don't really miss it because I mean, I could go out and buy a boat, another sailboat, but I couldn't do it the way I used to. And it's not only I can't do it; I don't think I have the nerve for it anymore either. You, lo you not only lose the physical, and the endurance. You lose the. I don't know if guys like Roald Amundsen and um, Bill Tillman and those kind of guys did, but I think you lose the nerve. So I learned to sail in, in Georgia Strait on my first sailboat in reasonably light winds. It doesn't get much more than about 30 knots in the Georgia Strait. Then we moved to Prince Rupert, and that's where I really learned to sail. Strong winds, strong currents, poor visibility, um, shallow water, lots of rocks, but mostly strong winds. And then the, you have access to Haida Gwaii and Hecate Strait and Dixon Entrance. And so that's where I really learned to sail in strong winds. And then we moved to Prince Rupert, I mean to Victoria from Prince Rupert in 1991. And I bought my third sailboat. So that's Elsa Day 3. And that was a steel boat. and It was a cutter. and So I was no beginner then. I, I turned myself an apprentice in, in, Van, in Georgia Strait and a journeyman learning his trade up in Rupert as far as being a mariner goes. And then I, then I went to sea. In 2000, 2001 left Victoria and I was going to Samoa. I don't tend to make short passages. <laughs> and um, I got to the other side of there. I just got before the equator and my steering gear broke. So I sailed back to Hawaii and got that welded. The area on the equator between the Line Islands, which is just south of Hawaii, and the Marshall Islands is fantastic because that's where the whalers used to go um, in the 17th and 18th century, or the, the uh, 18th and the 19th century. And they weren't the whalers and the sealers. They're they're not they're not environmentalists, but they're magnificent mariners. <laughs> and so on my third voyage, I was to get to a lot of places where they went in the in the southern Indian Ocean and the southern Atlantic Ocean. But and so that was the and then and then I went from the Marshall Islands on my second voyage up to the Aleutians, and that was my first trip to the Aleutians. Botanically and birdwise and geologically, Aleutians is fantastic. Like it's my favorite place in the northern hemisphere. Um, and then in 2003, I took early retirement. So in 2004, I left 
on the third voyage, which were those first two voyages were really just training for, in my view. And then I came back nine years later <laughs> in 2013. But, um, so I guess I miss it a little bit. But the I still do the same four things and I still have the same notebook. <laughs> and so, and I still eat the same food. Like on, on my boat, you'll see these, um, these 20 liter plastic pails and the 10 liter plastic pails with the snap lids. It's the same, same ones I took off the boat when I sold the boat. And I, and I have the same stuff in them. I still, I make my own bread the same. And some of them are full of beans. And I have my French pressure cooker there from New Caledonia. <laughs> and so my diet's the same. But the, um, no, I mean the, um, if I hadn't have done that, you know, those three voyages, I wouldn't be content. And so since I've done them, to answer your question, I am content. But would I like to see the Aleutians again? Yeah, I would. <laughs> so I bring these um, bonsais with me. I'm training them to be bonsais. And I don't like to leave them in the condo for the six months I'm running around because they might not get watered. So this one's a um, white bark pine. It's the third year I've had it with me. And um, white bark pine grows in the interior of BC. This one came from over the other side of the Fraser River up near the Elizabeth mine which is a gold mine, which oh, it's not operating now, but it's very similar geologically to this one. I was there two years ago. And so that, so that one comes from. This one's a false azalea. Those are quite common. And this one's a, um, a bitter root. And there's still, there's still a few signs of them around, but the, the leaves die, and then the, the flowers come up. And that's why I brought this, bring this along so I can look at the flowers every year. But um, they, they grow underneath sagebrush. And so you can go, you can go where sagebrush grows like between Lytton and Spence's Bridge in Cache Creek. This is in the same family as, um, it's in the Portulaceae family, same f family as the, um, I don't want to call it Indian potato, but that's what its common name is. And it's um, Claytonia um, lens, uh, Claytonia something. There's fields of it now up in the, up in the Alpine, same family as this one. Do you obviously mean something to you to carry them around like this? Yeah, well, um, they probably do. But like one of my favorite expressions is I never took psychology, I took science. So I don't know the reason for it. <laughs> so I gave up sailing because I couldn't um, do it the way that I used to be able to do it. So I sold the boat and I bought this RV. <laughs> and so this is my fourth season with the RV. So a season starts in April, I leave Victoria, I go back at the end of um, September. And I call, you know, up where all that junk is, I call that the four peak. And I don't say I'm parked here. I say I'm anchored here. And so I do the same four things. I mentioned the birds, the botany, and the animals. There's another thing that I spend a lot of time at, and that's geology. And um, I've never taken a geology course in my life. It was, it was biology and, and biochemistry that I studied at, at Simon Fraser. But the way I paid for that was working for mining companies as a prospector. So I worked with geologists then, and I learned from them. And um, I went away from it for about 30 years, maybe even more, without doing hardly any geology. And now I'm back at it, and it's amazing that the information stays in one's mind. So I have my motorbike because I'm not so, um, um, I'm not like a mountain goat, and I can't, um, I don't have your your um, endurance and all that good stuff anymore. So I found I couldn't get up the hill, so I bought that motorbike. So when I was at Dun Lake in April, I came up here almost this far, and then it was all snow, so I couldn't come further. But I saw on the map that there was that road going up to the lookout, which gives me access to alpine botany and geology. There's some fantastic geology up top, um, where I mentioned this was a, about 200 to 300 million years ago, this rocks were sitting on. Well, the rock that brought all the gold is an intrusive and it's a Cretaceous in intrusion and it's about a hundred million years old and, and the contact is right up on the top of the mountain there and it's fantastic. And so that's one of the, that's why I came here. Geology, old mining history, alpine botany and um, isolation. No, not many people come up the road.
to head up to the top of Baldy and bag a flight down to the upper cup lock. And then from there, hike back up to camp here. It'll be about hour, hour hike or so. And then, uh, and then tomorrow is supposed to be really good weather. Uh, sunny, sunny weather and uh, potentially uh, more flyable. Um, but I don't think I'm going to make it over to Dunn. It's, it's quite a bit of snow right now. And so I won't be able to make the traverse. It'll just be too arduous. So uh, yeah, recon day on Baldy. And uh, my objective of Dunn Peak is getting closer. Northwest Ridge, done. Almost there. Okay, gotta get set up quick and go. I don't have it in me anymore to go back that 1,700 nautical miles from Juan de Fuca because that's the way I'd want to do it. I wouldn't, wouldn't go along the, the coast, and so it'd be in the order of 1,700 miles. And, you know, you're going to get the odd low and the odd cold front. And Now, I, I know what to do with those, but the um, I don't think I have it in me anymore. But but I have the desire, though. <laughs> that never, that never goes I don't away. think it's going to go away, but, you know, maybe ask me when you, you won't see me up here again in another 10 years, I wouldn't imagine, but, I mean maybe in another 10 years. I'd admit it's gone away, but I think it's gone away. But I feel content with it because I did what I wanted to do and, and I pushed the boundaries, just like you're doing, pushing the boundaries, flying. But I pushed the boundaries and, and I survived and I didn't hurt myself and I didn't wreck my equipment. And um, and I miss, But I do miss it. I've, um, I told you the last time you were here, I've, I've more or less finished my book now. I've got it on my, my, my laptop. I wasn't going to um, write one because I didn't think I had anything to add to the situation. And, um, and I probably don't have anything to add to the situation, the situation being navigating the world's oceans. But um, my combination of um, animals, birds, plants, and rocks, uh, and my way of sailing um, may be entertaining. But, 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 but my main point in doing it is I'd like to motivate some, you know, some people, you know, your age, and even younger, um, but with, with people who are physical, right, and people who have a mind and people who have a spirit to do to do things that don't cost, don't have to cost a lot of money, but you have to know what you're doing and you have to be strong and you have to be brave, and you have to train yourself. But that's exactly what you're doing. In October of 2019, Eris came into my life and she joined me on my own single-handed adventures. Together, we flew in the Coast Mountains, in the trench of the Canadian Rockies and the Cascades, we landed on mountaintops and played in streams. We slept under the stars and watched sunrises from the sky. On Eris' third year of flying, we set out from town on a spring day to fly 100 kilometers to a place that held much significance to me, to Mount Baldy. Kamloops to Mount Baldy. This has been the dream for quite a while. 
finally making it happen with with G is just so cool. <laughs> Pretty unreal. We're almost there, girl. We're almost there. The flight from Kamloops felt like the culmination of all my dedication to learning the discipline of free flight. The skills and confidence I gained got me here with Eris, to a place that inspired a lot of my flying in the early days. It was three years since I had met Greg on the side of this mountain, but I had never forgotten about him. As I approached the summit of Mount Baldy, I remembered the music in the cup block and the stories he told about going into the unknown, the desire for adventure and the journey of preparing for it. Landing on Mount Baldy that day, I wished that Greg was anchored below so I could run down and tell him of all the adventures that had prepared me for the long-awaited return to this mountaintop and how much our conversation meant to me. I don't know where he was that day, but I knew he was somewhere out there exploring the places that inspired him.